I have been playing video games since I can remember. They are great on many levels. Their stories though, not so much. What if I told you that the best narrative award winners are for the most part just doing the absolute bare minimum in terms of storytelling? Yes, this includes games like The Last of Us, God of War and Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy. All are doing the minimum required to tell a story. The same minimum every first semester screenwriting student must follow. We are still in the infancy of narrative in video games, that's the bad news. The good news is we are still in the infancy of narrative in video games, meaning it's fairly easy to improve everything. Starting with my 5 ways series, I'll showcase simple tricks and methods to improve storytelling. Most of these you'd hear in a first semester screenwriting course, but adapted for video games. So let's not waste any time and start with number 1. Have an actual narrative. But Selvir, you paragon of writing virtue with an unquantifiable accent that moves between Arnold's Kindergarten Cop and Van Damme's Guile. They already have a narrative, right? Wrong. Most games don't have a narrative. Most games have connective tissue masquerading as a narrative. Don't worry, I'll explain in detail what I mean by that. Back when I was still a student in college, I did the sensible thing almost all students do. Waste a lot of money on useless crap. The stuff I wasted my money on were collector's editions of games I liked. One of them was Gears of War 3 and it came with a ton of behind the scenes footage. One BTS was about the game's narrative and how it was crafted. Spoiler alert, it wasn't. What they did was basically this. The game designers would come up with a level and then the writers were tasked with crafting a narrative around it. Literally just connective tissue. This is why the entire story unfolds via quest markers and cinematics to connect the levels and why this huge disconnect between the characters in narrative versus gameplay exists. Now that I think of it, there is a movie which has been written this way too. And it's the incredibly sophisticated Oscar bait known as Transformers 2 Revenge of the Fallen. You see, back then there was another writer strike going on. And good old Michael Bay is a man without any patience. So he started filming mid strikes without a finished screenplay. Actually, I think without a screenplay at all. So three little scabs by the name of Kurtzman, Orsi and Kruger were hired to write a so-called scriptment. A screenplay disguised as a treatment. Connective tissue meant to bind whatever the heck Bay was filming. This is why they teleport so much around in that movie and why it's nothing more than a disjointed mess. Have you lost your mind? No. You've lost your balls. Not a good way to tell a story, but that's exactly what video games have been doing for decades. Only in recent memory did games switch to a script based approach. Every single best narrative winner had a screenplay written for it prior to production. And this is what I mean by have a narrative. Narrative is just a synonym for story, story is just a synonym for structure and structure is just a vehicle through which character change manifests. Change is at the core of storytelling, which leads us to number two, have a character spine. The Last of Us is remembered for being the game that propelled video game narratives into the mainstream. People started to look at games through a more serious lens and all it did was give Joel a character spine, something you learn in your very first screenwriting class. Now, I'm not saying this to undermine The Last of Us, I'm saying this to show you how important a character spine is for the narrative. These are your building blocks and you better understand them before you make your game. So what is a character spine? It's the hero's want and the hero's need. What does Joe want? To protect Ellie at all costs. What does Joel need? To reconnect with his role as a father. The character's want can only be accomplished by overcoming the character's need. This is one of the basic building blocks of story. Boy meets girl. Boy wants girl. Boy can't get girl because he's wholly inadequate. So boy goes out into the world, trains, becomes smarter, faster, stronger, better. Boy returns and gets the girl. And also some... What? and almost every best narrative winner utilizes a character spine in some way, either through just narrative or even within the gameplay. Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy did just that. Each character's most powerful ability is locked behind the character's need. Only when a character overcomes their need does the ability unlock for the player to use. The character spine was literally baked into the gameplay. Baked into the gameplay is the theme of this video, which leads us into number three have a midpoint. Now the midpoint is also tied to the hero's need and flaw. Usually at the midpoint the hero discovers the first key they need for their transformation. The transformation being the final decision to change at the end of the second act. So it's a pretty big deal. The midpoint must accomplish two additional things. First, be in the middle as the name suggests. 
but second, it must raise the stakes. Like Rocket Fuel, it needs to take us over the second half of the second act right before the story is given new life through the third act. For video games, the midpoint is key in tackling one singular problem. Most people don't finish playing games. And this happens to games with great gameplay, so I think the narrative is most to blame. For most video games, the narrative just fizzles out and people lose interest. The midpoint would be the first step to take when it comes to extending the lifeline of your story. You can watch my video The Storytelling of Psychonauts 2 for a detailed breakdown of how the midpoint can give new life to a video game and extend playtime. Number 4. Drop Ludo Narrative Dissonance. Remember these moments? These painfully long and pointless walkathons. This was an attempt by game devs to reduce Ludo narrative dissonance because they made a grave mistake, a mistake that can destroy entire empires or countries. They listened to journalists. You know what? For a minute, they're almost useful. Attention, motor school, APCs. He doesn't like women, does he? Oh no, no, he doesn't like journalists. In particular, video game journalists who have latched onto this concept with the speed of a face hugger going after a new victim. Now, if you don't know what ludo narrative dissonance is, it's basically the disconnect between the narrative told through non-interactive elements, i.e. cutscenes versus gameplay. And you can see why journals use this concept as a metric. It's easy to judge a story without understanding anything about story. This pops up a lot with games like the Uncharted series or the recent Tomb Raider games. How come the likable rogue is slaughtering hundreds of people? How come Lara is distraught during her first kill and then subsequently massacres hundreds of enemies? From a storytelling standpoint, the answer is simple. That's not the story. Why are the 300 not suffering from PTSD and the horrors of war? Because that's not the story. Why doesn't Bruce Wayne go to therapy to overcome his grief, but instead beats up criminals dressed as a giant bat? That's not the story. I think you can catch my drift here. It is very easy to deconstruct any story with elements not pertinent to said story. Academics have made entire careers out of this Uroboros of gobbledygook. And I only care about one thing and one thing only. How to improve and tell a story in the best way possible. And a blind obedience to reducing ludo narrative dissonance is doing more harm than good. Some of the best stories in video game history have been told on purpose with increased dissonance. Spec Ops The Line is probably among the best video game narratives out there and its dissonance is off the charts. It's the point of the story. And to be frank, the arguments that have always accompanied this concept are just weak. Lara was only distraught during her first kill because A, it's the first kill, and B, from that point in the story, you are playing a character in a continuous fight or flight response. That is the story and that is the game. Even actual real life soldiers have to eventually snap out of their shell shock in order to survive. The bombs will continue to drop regardless of your mental state, so it's do or die. Oh, Jesus Christ! Listen, you cherry fuck! You calling that snake and nape and get us some bum bum now! This is one of the elements I love about Attack on Titan. Also, skip to this mark if you want to avoid any season 3 spoilers for Attack on Titan. It shows the horrors of war, but it also shows the options each soldier has, which is to either succumb to the horrors and most likely die, or to face them head on and at least go down in a blaze of glory with one last huzzah. You think any of these guys has the time to dwell on the fact that a massive monkey is throwing curveballs of debris at them? My soldiers push forward! My soldiers scream out! My soldiers rage! And Levi is my favorite manlet. Just look at him go. God, I love Japan. So, shameless self-plug here. Instead of using ludo narrative dissonance, use number five, play don't show. Remember that active reload minigame from the Gears of War series? What if your safety window for a quick reload was not tied to the weapon, but your performance as a player? So that gray bar stays bigger, the better you shoot, dodge, pop and kill, mimicking what the character experiences in the game. Mimicking the character's state of mind. If they are frantic, aimless and useless in combat, the window is also smaller, making it harder for the player to hit the successful quick reload. Devil May Cry 5 did something similar. Here the playback of the soundtrack was affected by the player's style performance. The more stylish you played the game, the more bombastic the soundtrack came across.
trust. This is what I like to call play, don't show. And many devs have slowly begun to implement this method and I'm not even sure the industry has a name for it. I think of it as the equivalent to show don't tell, but since video games are at the core and interactive medium, play don't show was the obvious choice. The entire enemy roster of Psychonauts 2, for example, is tied to a character's emotions. Every time you enter someone's mind, you are confronted with what that mind suffers from. Perfect execution of play don't show. And that's it everyone, 5 ways to improve storytelling in video games. Let me know in the comments what you think works well and what needs more work. Also, what games would have benefited the most from this advice? Be sure to like, subscribe and hit that notification bell as this too will be an ongoing series. Until then, I'll see you on the next page of storytelling.